Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, I'm Julio Capo, um, and I'm the, the Deputy Director of Florida International University's Emerging Preeminent Wilsonian Public Humanities Lab. Uh, so thank you for, for joining us uh, here on our second episode of Coffee and Conversations, Cultural Institutions uh, in Times of Crisis. Last week, our founding director, Rebecca Friedman, had a really lovely chat uh, with Jordana Pomeroy, the director of the Patricia and Philip Frost Art Museum here at FIU. Um, and you can find that episode on the WPHL YouTube page, as well as on our website, which is wphl.fiu.edu. Check us out there and uh, to learn more about the work we're doing, especially right now, in response to the novel coronavirus pandemic. Uh, this series, Coffee and Conversations, gives us direct insight into the work being done right now through conversations with leaders and cultural institute of cultural institutions to highlight the important work they're doing and see how we as a community can learn more about their work and best support them, especially during this difficult time. Our format is simple and it lasts no more than, than 30 minutes. Um, I ask our guests a few questions and we all learn from what they have to say. Um, I'll then take a few questions from the audience. At, at any time during this live webinar, please submit a question. You can find that button just below on your screen. Um, and I ask that you kindly identify yourself so that we can have a, a continued discussion, perhaps even after all this. Um, we'll get to as many of these as possible, and, and we'll try to follow up on those we don't get to uh, at a later episode or, or privately. Um, today, I welcome, as you can see on screen, Dr. Hunter Ohanian, the Executive Director of the Stonewall National Museum and Archives in Fort Lauderdale in Florida. Thanks, Hunter. Um, uh -huh. Hi, I'm going to introduce you because there's a lot of awesome stuff here to say. Um, and before I, I, I do, I just want to say very briefly, uh, Stonewall has a, a, a really lovely gallery space here in the heart of Wilton Manors as well. Um, and both of these spaces are, are just so meaningful to me on a personal level as they are with so many other people. I worked as an intern at Stonewall 15 years ago in their archives um, and have worked very closely with them in the past. Uh, whether it was writing my, my book on Miami's lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender queer history, or to curate my exhibition last year in History Miami Museum. Uh, Stonewall is a beautiful and a critical space, and it has been since 1972, for recording and preserving a history that is too often neglected or placed in the margins. And it's just such a, a caring space that, that builds community and has been a home for me for, for many years. Um, so, Thank you for being, Hunter, being here, Hunter, and for the work you do. Let me now say all the good stuff. And it, it won't even, you know, scratch the surface. Hunter Ohanian, goodness. Um, he joined Stonewall as executive director in late 2019 and has held so many important titles and posts, I won't even get through most of them, uh, including as head of the College Art Association, the founding director of the Leslie Lohman Museum of, of Gay and Lesbian Art, the director of the Foundation for Massachusetts College of Art and Design in Boston, and director of the Fine Arts Work Center in P-Town. I love that place so much, um, among so many, many others. Uh, I encourage you to go to the Stonewall site, that's stonewall-museum.org, to read more about him and his work um, including as many publications and contributions to the nonprofit world, um, and of course, to visit uh, more with the cultural institution. Welcome, Hunter. Thank you. Thank you so much for hosting this and for hosting me. It's a great opportunity for people to get together in this sort of wacky, weird time that we're living in right now. And so thank you for the effort that you've done in actually uh, presenting conversation and thoughts and ideas and support for each other because the nonprofit world and particularly on the visual arts side is not easy on a day to day basis. And then if you lay a uh, worldwide pandemic on top of it, it's a it's a tough road out there right now. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Thank you. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, well, to start, can you tell us about the work uh, you do at the Stonewall National Museum and Archives? Sure. So just a quick, a quick uh, background. Uh, Julio did mention about the website. Everybody should go take a look at it. It's got it's filled with facts and figures and all sorts of things. But it is stonewall-museum.org. The first thing I have to say, it has nothing to do with the Stonewall Inn. Uh, a lot of people get confused by that. But our quick history is that we were founded uh, nearly 50 years ago by somebody who was living, a young man who, whose name, was, uh, name is Mark Silber, and he was living in Hollywood, and he came out to his parents in 1973. And um, they were very accepting and very welcome, and he started uh, collecting gay-themed books. And um, 
by 1980, he moved back to New York where his family was from. And so what he decided to do, he had this whole room of books, and he decided that he wanted to create a gay library. At that time, one had not existed. There were a number of gay bookstores, but there were certainly no archives or gay library at that time. So he set up the Stonewall Library and Archives, and he used the word Stonewall because at the time, Stonewall was really synonymous with civil rights, particularly gay civil rights. And so he chose that word. Now today, 50 years later, we have the largest LGBTQ library in the world, uh, over 28,000 volumes. Uh, we're very fortunate we are in one of the Broward County Library buildings, um, and so they provide a great physical home for us. And then in addition to the library, uh, we, have, um, we have little over 2,000, actually 2,700 linear feet of archival materials. And not that I've personally counted, but there are over 6 million pages of LGBT history um, dating primarily back to the last quarter of the 20th century to the present day. So what you have is this amazing trove. And the trove is, it covers everything from periodicals to newsletters to, to uh, homemade newsletters to individual leaders' papers, uh, magazines, um, um, uh, costumes wa worn by f famous gay actors. Um, and it's, it's a huge resource. And obviously, you were able to use it in your book, which, by the way, I just fin finished about six months ago. It's a wonderful book. Thank you very, very much for, for that. Um, and, um, and so it's a resource that people use um, to really to, to actually do two things. Um, I think one is to show that we existed. And because there's nothing better than actual proof in front of you. And the second thing is to actually provide the facts for historians and for people going forward. Um, those of us who maintain histories, who maintain archives, we, the, the records that we keep is the way in which history will be written in the future. And if we don't maintain them, then our history will be written in another way. Um, we all have our own inter interpretation of things. But thank God organizations like Stonewall exist because they allow the history to be recorded in a particular place. It's always subject to interpretation, of course. It's never complete, but we're far better off with having these amazing troves of gay history, particularly to 20th century history and 21st century, of course, too. Um, thank you for that. Thank, I, I wonder if we can uh, get a little to where we are right now. So if we think about uh, what are you and your colleagues doing at this very moment, you know, dealing with the changes and effects by the novel coronavirus. I mean, this history, of course, is so important. Uh, and if it's not recorded by places like Stonewall, what's to happen to them? Yeah, it's, that's a really important question. So I've, as you pointed out, I've been running nonprofit organizations for 20 years. And, and you know, as a business model, they're not particularly good. Um, <laughs> there are many u universities and big museums that are well funded, but a lot of the smaller organizations that we are all associated with, are involved with, um, historically and chronically, they are underfunded and under-resourced. I used to sit on these panels for the NEA and for um, uh, uh, Massachusetts Cultural Council, and one of the things that was always, we'd go through people's um, financial statements. And one of the things that was always so important was to see what their reserves were, were like. And the truth is, smaller nonprofit organizations are, are just so undercapitalized. The ideal, of course, would be to, to make sure that they have six months of spending in the bank in a re reserve at any time. But unfortunately, so many of us running these organizations are left with very, very few resources. So the, the, the first lesson for, for me in this is that this is an absolute uh, perfect point or perfect proof that we as nonprofit leaders have to work to be able to be sure that our organizations are capitalized as best as we possibly can. So to answer your question about Stonewall, we are a small 
organization, $600,000 a, a year annual budget. We have virtually no cash reserve at all. Now we have four full-time employees. We've had to lay off one and the remaining three employees um, by week two, I had to reduce their salaries by 40%. Now, how are we staying? So our library is closed, the museum is closed, the archives are closed. Um, the, the three of us who are remaining staff members, we meet on the phone twice a week. We have twice weekly uh, staff meetings. We have an ongoing agenda. There are the immediate things that have to be dealt with about making sure the properties are secure at this time. And then also, um, we're catching up on a lot of work uh, that has had been put to a side. Uh, we've had to totally put our exhibition program um, on hold. All of our, our uh, book clubs and, and uh, events, those are all on hold right now. Um, and so we've been spending a lot of time um, uh, refining upcoming exhibitions. And then also we have dug in very deeply into foundation uh, fundraising at this point. So we're doing, we're spending a lot of time doing research on new donors, defining, or defining and redefining our uh, fundraising appeals and spending time with our board and our national advisory council um, doing work which um, we would love to have the time to do the rest of the time, but doing work as far as identifying contacts and individuals who can help us secure funding in the future. I'm trying to use this period to, to sort of lay the groundwork for us being stronger on the other side of things. Um, last week, of course, we spent a lot of time working um, on the new things that came out under the CARES Act. Uh, it was passed on a Friday uh, by Saturday. Uh, we had completed the first application um, under the uh, uh, economic economic or the uh, economic disaster injury portion. And then last Saturday, uh, we had filed everything for the PPP program. And last Saturday, we had some more requests from the bank. And then um, we're very, um, we're, I think we've gone through everything on the, on the bank side as far as that goes. And we're now waiting for the SBA. We all saw possibly some news this morning that was not great, that the SBA is, is taking longer to fund these things, even though the banks are approving these loans. Um, we've sent out some um, emergency, I don't want to quite call them emergency, uh, but we've sent out some, some strong fundraising letters to the board and to our donors to help us um, help us continue to be engaged. Um, I do, we have a lot of volunteers at Stonewall. I do a weekly newsletter just to the volunteers that's sort of more uh, in depth. Uh, they respond to it, so I know they're reading it. Uh, we keep our Facebook posts up and all of our social media posts going up so that we stay engaged with them. I've been thinking about um, um, starting a new little game or series about people speaking about some of their favorite gay books out there and have and create opportunities. But, it, you know, I'm, I'm trying to find as many different ways to engage our audience as we possibly can. And while Emery Grant, who's the deputy director who deals mostly with programming, um, we we do a large seminar every year or symposium every year for um, uh, school administrators and, and, and faculty members who deal with LGBTQ youth at risk. We had to cancel it, of course, because it was in April this year, but we'll be doing that on April 22, and we'll be doing it for three hours, and it will be on the same foot format. It will be uh, th through Zoom as well, too, and so we want to be able to give resources to people out there, um, and as I said, we're spending a lot of time on fundraising, and our development person has been d doing that, so we've been bit busy. Um, there's no two ways about it, um, and um, planning. Um, and trying to be sure that we keep the organization open. I think we will see some organizations not survive this period. Um, I, I, in fact, I don't worry about Stonewall because the strength of what we have is really the books and the archives and everything going there. And no one's gonna take that stuff to a d dumpster. Um, and it's going to be preserved and we're going to be able to pay our rent going forward. What I worry about 
is the level of public programming because as those of you, of you who are involved in organizations, either large or small, you know that it takes a lot of money to put programming on. And, um, and I know many organizations are overextended. Uh, even though we may not be well capitalized, we don't have any loans, which is a good place to be. And so we don't have, a, we, we don't have other than paying our rent and paying for our four employees, those are really what we have. Um, Hunter, this is this is so incredible to hear, and I have it's all, a lot of it is very, of course, for me, and I'm sure for so many others here, also really difficult to hear uh, uh, in in many respects. I wonder, just to kind of interject slightly, when you said the, you know, they're not going to be thrown into dumpsters, but one of the immediately, you know, things that I think of, of course, is how many uh, how many of these archives are are now created because people saved, right? They went dumpster diving. You know, how many times people kind of scrub away LGBTQ history from people's attics after they pass away? That um, maybe you could say a kind of no. It's actually kind of uh, I don't want to get to this question uh, until just a minute, but I it, it actually kind of intersects one of the things I'm thinking about. So I'll get to Marianne uh, Lamonaca, who is uh, uh, the uh, excuse me, the, the chief curator at the Bard Graduate Center Gallery in New York, who, who's really curious about how, uh, uh, you know, how can people donate to Stonewall's assets and, in, in, you know, into the county? Uh, how can they, if, so that, you know, these histories don't get thrown into the dumpster? Is there a way that people could learn about doing that? And just to, to kind of add to that last part too, um, can people find out about the Stonewall National Education Project, which we, you know, here at the WPHL, we were, we were of course hosting uh, later this week. Um, is that something that they could find out on their website? Now it's, it's free and open to the public. It always has, you know, but is that something that they can learn that way? Yes, absolutely. So starting, starting at the end of that, um, they can learn about the symposium by going to our website. Uh, there's a tab at the very top of it that says symposium. It has all the information there as well as the schedule and how they can log in. And so er everything is there. It's, it, we, we will host as many people as Zoom will allow us to host, and uh, hopefully we won't crash the system. There's been a lot of people, of course, who've been interested in joining it. Um, I, yes, the, the thing about people throwing away gay histories um, is a really big deal. When I was the director of the Leslie Lohman Museum, I saw that more than, than I see it here. Family members would come by and just drop off a box at the front door. No name, nothing. And it was simply because somebody in the family wanted to keep these materials for posterity and because they believed in the loved one who had passed away or who was sick and was going to, to die. And clearly in the 80s and the 90s, and actually that's how Leslie Lohman started, um, in the, in, uh, later into the 80s and the 90s when people died of AIDS, many, many stuff, some families would just throw the stuff away, but others were smart enough to be able to save it. So for Stonewall, um, it really is nothing more complicated than contacting us, um, and there are a million different ways of d doing it, whether you go through the, and the website is the best way. Everybody says a hundred e emails and phone numbers there, and we will, we will take anything in that's gate related. And even if somebody has a question about it, we'll still t take it in. Um, and so I urge people to bring it. Um, we're at, we're at uh, 1300 East Sunrise in Fort Lauderdale. But I also urge people to go to our website. And if you look under programs, there's a tab there called additional resources. So Stonewall is one of at least 25 gay archives around the country. So let's say somebody has a lesbian aunt in, uh, in Seattle. There's a wonderful organization there. And should her house be cleaned out or if there are papers or things that are going on and you don't wanna send something to Florida, Virtually throughout the entire nation, there are gay archives and libraries that are available to all of us. And, and as I said in the beginning, the importance of keeping this, it's better to let an archivist throw it away than you make the decision that it gets thrown away. And it's, it's better for us to try to be able to preserve as complete of a record as we possibly can. So yes, thank you, because it's, it's a major piece. Almost 99% of what we have in our holdings have, has come in from individual donors. Thank you, thank you. And it's, it's, it's finding the right space for it. it. May not, you know, sometimes it's stonewall, it's thank you for that. Um, and a really important question, if we could answer briefly, because I want to make sure we get to all these questions. Um, uh, very, well, it's not really a brief question. <laughs> uh, 
what can we do to continue supporting Stonewall to, to, to you know, how can, how can the public continue to support Stonewall? Um, and what does the future look like for, uh, um, for, for Stonewall? And, and perhaps, you know, if you could open it up to how you see, which you talked to, you know, touched upon already a little bit, uh, other, other kind of cultural institutions at this moment. I think um, the future for Stonewall, quite frankly, is very bright, despite these bleak situations. I, I am incredibly but bullish on us right now. And I'm, I'm but bullish because even though we may not have money and resources and we're dealing with this nonsense, we have an amazing trove of documents. So I think the thing that, the thing that I'm frustrated the most about and that I would like the most help with is how we get the information in those documents out to a broader c community. My vision for Stonewall is to really see us be this hive of activity, of queer activity in South Florida, that then sends this information, whether they're the documents or the ideas, because the, because the documents only represent the ideas. It's the knowledge and the history and the ideas that I want to get out and be sure are in front of individuals, gay, straight, young, old, black, white, I don't care. I want them to be out there. And I want people to know that they that those resources are there for, for them. So for us, think about how you can use the resources. Think about the book. Think about the exhibition. Think about the talk. Think about the opportunity of bringing these resources to your organization. And it's not so much about bringing our organization out. Sure, our name will go on it, but that's not as important to me as much as it is to have the ideas out there. That's why we save them. It does us no good to keep them locked up in a vault. The most important thing is to get them out. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I, I would love to, to uh, if you have any last minute, you know, last thoughts that you'd like to do. If not, I'd love to open it up further to, to Q and A from everyone. Uh, I, I, do you want to get to the questions, Hunter, or do you have? No, no, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. I'm sitting here. I'm sitting here outside a, a McDonald's in uh, in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, and so it's kind of sunny and nice here. And that's the only place I could find internet, so it's fun. I'm a little jealous because I'm indoors. As, <laughs> um, it's where a little colder. It's a little colder here in North Carolina than it is in uh, in Wilton Manors. I have to say. Fair enough. I went. Um, <laughs> so I want to ask a follow up question. Marianne uh, Lamonaka had a great question as well, a follow up to that. Um, and, and was curious when the relationship with the kind of space in which uh, Stonewall is housed with, the Broward, with Broward County, how that relationship started and, and um, uh, what, what that's like to work with the county more generally. Sure. Um, so we have 6,500 square feet in a building that used to be the main branch of the Broward County Library on East Sunrise. And about 10 years ago, we had two um, uh, uh, county commissioners who were gay, who were very active. One of them is now the mayor of uh, Fort Lauderdale, uh, Dean Trentalis. And they felt that Stonewall was very important. And so they saw to it that we would be part of a consortium of nonprofit organizations that would have a permanent home in this repurposed library. So I don't want people to get jealous, but we have 6,500 square feet of air conditioned space that we pay $1,300 a month for. And to me, that's like having an endowment. I can't pay anybody for that, but I can always raise $12,000 a year to be sure, or $15,000 a year to be sure that those records will be preserved. And, and they're in an environmentally safe place. And that goes for the books and for the archives. So my advice about that is um, a lot of people don't necessarily like hearing this, but it is very important to keep your relationship with your community and political leaders intact. And my experience having worked with a lot of LGBTQ uh, public officials um, is that they are very willing to help see our community thrive and be secure. And if they've got a, a chance to help us have a seat at the table, they will do it. So if you have an opportunity to create a relationship um, with an LGBTQ public official, try to begin to develop that relationship so they understand the value of what you, you do. Thank you for that. Um, to, we, we have about two or three minutes before we, we, we wrap up. I want to 
there was a great question here uh, from uh, Rebecca Friedman, the director of the WPHL, to ask if you uh, can talk a little bit about uh, the digitization projects that may or may not be going, you know, how, uh, you know, especially in this moment where it's, of course, we're working remotely, uh, what kind of progress might, uh, be, you know, what can people expect in the future, perhaps? Yeah, we unfortunately have been very much behind the eight ball. And thank you for the good question, Rebecca. We've been very much behind the eight ball on that. And that is something that we would like to see if possible. We've all seen major museums out there offer digital uh, collections online, uh, whether they're visual arts museum or archives or libraries. And that will be the, the future for us. And it is one of the things that we are looking at right now is funding for that purpose. It seems daunting to some way, to uh, some degree to say we want to digitize 6 million pages of material, but by the same token, it's not impossible. And if you start somewhere, you'll end s somewhere. And so it is something that we're looking for funding. Right now, nothing is available. Everything is cataloged. Nothing is digitized at this point, but on the library side, um, I am happy to say that again, if you go to the website, you can search and receive a um, synopsis, an abstract, of all 26,000 books in the library, and which is a astonishing. It's absolutely astonishing. And so you can go in there and you can see every Oscar Wilde book and you can see them all. Now, you can't see them full text, but at least you can do the research to be able to see what it is that you want to do. Someday soon, we will get to the digitization. We're just not there yet. Thanks. We, I only have time to, so this, we have several more questions and we'll get, to, I could, you know, send these to Hunter and, and I can respond to the one separately, though, you know, that I can respond to. Uh, but this last one is more of a comment, so it might be kind of a great way to, to kind of wrap up. Uh, but David Connor from Worcester, uh, hi David, at the Worcester David. Historical Museum, uh, it wanted to share that they're creating, this is of course is a community effort and I love, you know, that we could all share these things this way, uh, is creating a, a chronicling COVID website in English and in Spanish. Uh, to ch help change the narrative of how we document history in the city, uh, especially during the, the pandemic. Uh, and this is going to include queer history, oral collections, and, and you know, related to COVID. Um, that is, that we, the more that we all share these ideas and see this as part of a larger project, which is certainly what Stonewall is, is doing already, uh, and certainly Worcester and so many other of these spaces are, are doing. Um, I, I wonder if, I, I want to put a, a quick plug uh, for uh, next week, Thursday, April 23rd at 10 a.m., my wonderful colleague and our director here at WPHL, Rebecca Friedman, will be in conversation with the uh, incredible Susan Gladstone, who is the executive director of the, the Jewish Museum of Florida uh, at FIU. Um, Hunter, you've been such a treasure. Thank you for everything you do and uh, everything you continue to do and everything uh, that we can do as a community to help support you and the work that you're doing at Stonewall, please let us know. We're happy to do that. And, and thank you for everyone in attendance. Thank you. And uh, thank you as, as well. This is great to be able to share. It, it went by very fast. And also, I just want to throw out again, for anybody who has any questions as far as a nonprofit or Stonewall or anything else, if you go to stonewall-museum.org, uh, you'll see my email is hunter at Stonewall Museum ORG. Feel free to shoot me an email. Just put in the re line, you know, I saw you with Julio on the, on the w webinar and just say you want to follow up on something. I'm driving from Provincetown to Florida. I'm in the car. Call me. I'll be happy to chat with you. Thank you so much, Hunter. Thank you so much. And okay. thank you everyone again. Stay safe. Take care. Okay. Bye, everyone. <laughs>